All right, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm Lauren Lohman. I'm a marketing director here at Trust Pilot. And I just wanted to thank you for joining today's webinar, Five Help Checks for Managing Customer Retention. Uh, it's brought to you by us, Trust Pilot, and our partner, Tango. So today we're lucky enough to be joined by Omer Gottlieb. He's a chief commercial officer and co-founder at Tango, and also our very own Brian Merritt who's VP of Customer Success here at Trust Pilot. And so before we dive into these five health checks, there are two quick housekeeping items I want to mention. Um, the first is that today's webinar should be about 30 minutes in length. We might go a little bit longer, a little bit over. There's a lot of great content to share. Um, but if you do need to drop off, that's fine. Feel free to. We will send out a recording of the webinar um, afterwards, um, along with a slide share. And the second thing is that if you have any questions at any point in time during the webinar, just feel free to write them into the GoToWebinar question section on the right-hand side. Um, and if time allows at the end, we'll take those questions, answer them live, and any that we don't get to, we will email you after and provide a response. Um, so yeah, to get started, these are the five health checks for managing customer retention. They include product consumption, customer feedback, business outcomes, service utilization, and last but not least, support escalation. Uh, Brian and Omer will go through these in some good detail, provide some great examples for you, so it's very actionable and, and you walk away with some uh, next steps. So to get started, uh, I'll pass it off to Brian to do a quick intro of Trust Pilot. Great, thanks, Lauren. Um, hi, everyone, thanks for your time today. I'm Brian Merritt, uh, VP of Customer Success here at Trust Pilot. Um, I, just for scale, I, I have a team of about 20 here in my New York and Denver offices and then we have about 30 more folks between our London, Copenhagen, and Melbourne offices. So we are uh, a global company. But let's start with kind of who is Trustpilot. We're, we're new to the States, but very established overseas. Um, founded in 2007 in Copenhagen, uh, Trustpilot is a review community that, that helps businesses collect and publish reviews from their customers. Um, as you can see the, by the, the wonderful stats tab here, um, you know, we've got over 24 million reviews, 140,000 businesses, uh, whose websites have reviews, and uh, amazingly enough, reviews from 120 countries. Uh, one thing that we're really proud of is our Trust Pilot widgets, as we call them, uh, have over 1.4 billion impressions a month via our partner sites. So that's 1.4 billion times consumers are seeing reviews and, and have trust as part of their buying experience. Uh, there are really two parts to Trust Pilot as to why we exist. Uh, from the consumer's perspective, we are an open community. This is a place where consumers can leave uh, and read authentic reviews to help them make better buying decisions. Um, you know, if we go back to our earliest days, Trustpilot was founded in 2007 by Peter as he was, as his mother was making some buying decisions and he realized she really didn't have a good third party site to go to to make informed uh, buying decisions. For businesses, uh, the ability to collect reviews, we provide the ability to collect reviews and feedback to both accelerate business growth and improve the product and operations via that feedback. The three pillars of our business model are the, are the brand building through, through trust and through authentic third-party reviews, then leveraging those reviews via, via on-site display in your PPC campaigns and an organic search to drive that digital ROI that I know everyone's looking for in this day and age. Um, I, I imagine we all have a Google bill at some point uh, that comes due every month and we're always looking ways to make that more efficient. Um, the, final, the final place is through our insights generator, taking this feedback from, from the consumers in action and across your organization, making sure that the product team is seeing what they need to see, the customer service team is seeing what they need to see. Um, so really leveraging that feedback more than just uh, the, the marketing side of the house. Of course, the obligatory uh, who are our customer slides, but uh, I am really proud of this. We've got some great names and some great companies working with us, folks like JustFab and Jet.com um, in the kind of in the retail space, services, um, HomeAway and Home Advisor, uh, and finance and some some big brands out there, Western Union, Springleaf. The, the point being that wherever there is the need for a review platform, um, we can service a number of different industries. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Omer. I was just starting to say uh, thanks, Brian. It's always uh, good to have a great partner and customer on, on those webinars. So uh, thanks for that. Hi everybody, my name is Omer Gottlieb. I'm the Chief Customer Officer of Tutango and running our customer success team. Uh, and Tutango is the leader in the customer success technology. We've been founded about six years ago, and in the last six years, we're actually paving the way of 
how customers should run their customer success organization, investing a lot in best practices, riches, researches, uh, events that we're doing, and even a book that we published about uh, how to run customer success within organizations. Well, the essence of Kutango is the ability to connect to many data sources that you have in organization. So you, we can connect to your product, uh, we can connect to your feedback system, of course, your CRM, your billing, your support, and actually connect all the customer data to make sure you can drive action. Using the connected data, you monitor the, the meaningful health changes, and we'll discuss health in, in this webinar. But also make sure you deliver the right engagement every time for every user and every customer at the right time. Uh, it is a complete customer success platform built from an underlying layer of proactive customer and user, user monitoring, so capturing all the information in real time, providing you with early warning systems, uh, providing you with workflow and process to run your customer success team, uh, campaigns, the ability to outreach customers and educate them and drive them to action, and analytics, how to better predict churn and upsell and understand where you have issues with, with your customer base. So once we're done with you know, the explanation about the companies, let's actually start with uh, the five health checks man managing customer retention. Uh, one of the main keys for customer retention is the health of the customers. If you're doing a good job, you'll be able to have good visibility on how your customers are actually performing, who's having issues or not. So a good health score should be one, clear to understand, and two, Try to drive actions. So people will need to understand what they need to do with it. The first thing that we uh, preach to is product consumption. When somebody buys your product, they buy, buy to get something out of it. Uh, so one of the important things in order to have a really good health score is really measure, track, and report how customers are actually using your product. It's, it's one of the best ways to understand whether they see value from your product, or not, and obviously, it's a good indicator to identify risks. Uh, some of the researches we've done actually show that 90% of, of your churn is, is preceded by uh, product usage. But it's not that simple, and this is where I do encourage you to invest a lot of thinking and understanding how you should actually capture your product consumption and what does that mean. So first of all, you need to be smart. Uh, the fact that somebody is logging in a lot of time or using a report a lot of time doesn't necessarily mean that you actually see value or not. Uh, you have different use cases. You have different users that are using it, uh, job level, uh, um, sometimes even seasonality. So one of the most important parts is try to understand why people are buying your product, and then when you identify what are the things you want to include in the customer uh, in the in the customer health regarding product consumption, translate into that. Uh, your goal is to identify uh, the, the people that are lagging and not seeing enough value, and you need to actually create passionate and power users and be proactive. One of the examples I always like to give is think of, of use cases, and this is something from uh, one of our segments. Uh, initially, a person could buy your product for one or more use cases. So instead of just tracking a specific feature or login on time system, try to be a little more sophisticated and identify how many customers are actually using one or more use cases uh, uh, of your platform. So I mentioned before that, again, Tutano can be used for processes, for an early warning system, for campaigns, for analytics, for tasks. So that's a good way for me to really understand whether customers are seeing value or not by monitoring the number of use cases that they're actually uh, um, using the product. So number one, Product consumption, one of the best ways to understand whether your, your product, your customers, sees value or not. Brian, number two for you. Yeah, so thanks, Omar. Uh, so customer feedback is, is, is really an important uh, way to measure the health of your customer. Um, you know, ensuring that you're, you're, you're proactively asking customers for feedback throughout their journey is, is, is absolutely critical. Um, it's really important that you collect feedback from every customer. Um, you know, what, one of the things that consumers are looking at is, is can they trust uh, the feedback that's being uh, being used, and, and do, they, do they know the customers, I'm sorry, the clients or companies are actually listening to their feedback. Um, you know, so, so, so some tips there is proactive collection and, and thinking about when you want to collect. 
if your objective is to talk about the buying experience the customer may have just had on your website, then maybe it's, it's an immediate pop-up post-purchase. Post if you're looking more around product usage, then you may want to have uh, delays in there that, that prompt the consumer for reviews after they've received the product. It's very hard for consumers to, to give feedback on products they don't have their hands on yet. Um, and really making sure that it's easy, easy and seamless for the customer. The, the, the more you can do you know, in-app or on-site or in-purchase in path is great. I think we're all familiar with the, you know, the, the Uber model where at the time you complete your ride or before you book your next ride, you, you're asked to review that, that last ride. So they made it very seamless, and, and that's a lot of what the, some of the tools that Trustpilot provides is that seamlessness and easiness. Um, the, the format and then, uh, you know, to incent or not incent, that is the question. Um, you know, if you, if you start incenting customers to leave reviews, um, that has both good and bad connotations to it. Um, one of our best practices and our recommendations is, you know, rather than necessarily asking customers to leave a review, um, you know, obviously you want to you want to ask them to leave a review, whether positive or negative, as part of your incentive. You can't just incent for good reviews. Um, but then think about how you want to incent them. And one thing we found very useful um, when incenting for reviews is actually offering to make a donation in that customer's name or or to to an organization like the Red Cross, perhaps. Um, people feel really good about that. Um, and once you have that, that feedback, it's important. You, you've got to respond to it. Uh, consumers just took the time and effort to give you insight into your business. Um, responding to that feedback is critical. Both negative and positive reviews, everyone, everyone wants to know their voice is being heard. Um, so even if someone says, great job, five-star service, we'll definitely buy from you again, that's a, a, another reason to say, hey, thanks for that. Thanks for that note. We really enjoyed servicing you. Um, just, as, just as much as if it's a one-star review where they had some problems and you've addressed them. Um, and then categorizing and trafficking that action within the organization. The, the, the review doesn't end once once the person's hit submit or you've replied to it. Getting those 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 reviews over to the right departments so they can action. If there's a problem with your shipping and you recently changed your logistics provider, that's something very important for your operations team to know. Um, so, so getting that over there. There's the micro action about how do you respond to that review, but then there's a the macro action. What are the trends we're seeing? Um, and then of course the feedback loop to make sure that the customer uh, feels their issue was resolved. Um, and here's an example of, uh, of a client who's displaying these reviews on site, getting the, getting the trust and transparency there, um, you know, where they display both the reviews on site, so supporting that. Um, as you can see, they, 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 they receive their reviews. And here you can see examples of, of how they reply to reviews, both great service, thank you so much for taking the time to leave a review, as well as a challenging problem um, where they reach back out to, to support uh, the customer. Uh, Noah, you want to talk a little bit about business outcomes? Sure, yes, thanks for that. So now that we understand you know, whether customers are actually using our product and how they're using it, how they're consuming it, and we really understand the feedback and what are their pain points as they're actually uh, letting us know about it, one of the most important things is really understand the business outcomes. The purchase of service, not just to use a product, but also to understand, to actually get business results. For example, did they use my product and were able to increase revenue or in, improve productivity or higher quality of, of, of the services? Um, so the, the way you do that, you actually, and this is one of our best practices, we urge our customers to really identify the customer goals during onboarding. If you have a high-touch model, then that's probably easier. Uh, your customer success manager should identify the goals either pre-sale or post-sale with the customer and ask why did you buy our, our product. And, and you need to roll up into uh, the health score and monitor the changes. Uh, if you have uh, a very low touch model like some of our customers, uh, I would recommend even to actually send a survey during onboarding. Uh, it should be templated, so it shouldn't be like an open question. Uh, usually people buy this product for the five following reasons. Let's choose your first two. And then you can really align uh, the expectations regarding business results and the outcomes. I'll give an example of a marketing automation uh, company. So people are buying a marketing automation platform uh, sometimes to actually increase leads and, and, and convert leads. So one of the things to measure in addition to how they're using the product and whether they're running campaigns and, and, and opening emails and sending emails is basically that that translates into the business results that they're looking for. For example, 30% lead conversion could be a good sign, but 
uh, your team, your customer success team wants to know if there's a drop uh, that actually uh, goes down to 25%. So again, if you have the ability to ask your customers in the simplest way that's possible, what is the business reason you actually purchase your product? And you can model that into the health core. You have a clear alignment with the are actually seeing value in combining the product usage, or the feedback, and, and the business outcomes. Uh, one of the examples, and, and Brian, maybe you can speak to that, is how Trustpilot is using to Django in order to do that. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, when we, when we were thinking about how to measure the health of our business, um, you know, to, to Omar's point, um, you know, we really distilled it down to a few key metrics. We started out with many, many, many. Um, are they paying? Are they calling us? Are they logging support tickets? But at the end of the day, for, for, for our product and for our usage, what really counts is are they collecting reviews? If they're collecting reviews, they're seeing benefit from our product. If they're collecting fresh reviews, they're seeing ongoing benefit from our product. So when we look at our customers, we look at those in, those customers who are inviting and how many people they've invited the last month and then how many reviews they've, re, they've received the last month. And that should trend uh, should continuously trend upwards. When that falls down, that triggers my success managers to, to reach out to the customer and say, hey, what's going on? Did you know what was happening here? Again, we looked at things like, like payment status and, and all, all these things that are great and, and informative, but at the end of the day, payment status could be because you have a wrong billing contact or because they stopped using the product. This tells you if, 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 if they're not paying because they're not using the product. So it makes that billing conversation even easier because I see you're using our product. Oh, we have the wrong billing contact. Thanks. We'll update that now. Um, so again, this is how we're using the, to, you know, we've integrated our product data directly into the Tango. Um, so yeah, so uh, over, you want to talk a little bit about service utilization? Sure. So uh, another thing that is really important, I mean, it depends on how you like your, your uh, product, is understand whether uh, customers are actually utilizing the subscription. In case you're selling a product which is licensed by uh, CIF or by any other thing, one of the important things is to understand how many of them are actually active. So I can have, you know, a customer who's very active and using our product and, and maybe even sometimes getting good business results, but they purchased 100 seats and using just 10, uh, I know I'm going to have a problem in my next renewal conversation. They will probably ask for, for a discount because they're not using as much of the less as they bought. So one of the uh, important things to measure is whether they're actually high on their license utilization. Usually the number we'd like to see is 70% and, and above, but it really depends on, on the case by case. Um, so if you license your product by, again, any uh, parameter like seats, leads, uh, we have companies that are selling storage, data points, ads, uh, you want to make sure that you understand how much of them does the customer buy and how much of them are actually consuming. So if there's a major gap there, you'll be proactive and your team can actually approach them and say, hey, we identified that there's a gap there. Let me help you explain how to bridge the gap and how we can make more and more people using it or how we can use more leads or we can use more storage and so forth. So again, service utilization, really understanding whether they're using all the things or almost all the things they've actually purchased uh, and are happy with that. Brian, you want to speak about support? Sure, sure. We talk about support escalations. You know, in the, in the good old days, um, you know, we you would get a letter in the mail from a customer, and that was about the only way they could talk to you. Um, it feels like now there there are more channels popping up every day um, in terms of, of understanding the, your customers' interactions with support. Um, and it's really important that you know, as customers are reaching out across these different channels, uh, that they feel comfortable working through, that you feel comfortable responding to them. Um, you know, it's really it's important when you when you when you do hear from your customers. Uh, you need to understand where they're talking to you from. A uh, tool like Trustpilot allows you, allows you to get very direct results through a review invitation process, but depending on your industry or your vertical, uh, they may be talking to you from different channels. If you're a, a fast fashion retailer, they're probably talking to you on Instagram. Um, if you're more of an online financial services company, then they're probably talking to you over the phone. Um, but again, under, understanding where they're talking to you and then getting all of those, uh, those conversations into the same place um, you can have a unified voice and channel for responding to your consumers. Um, most companies have a, have a very fragmented support. We, we always recommend uh, the best practices here to kind of unify that voice at least, even if you're going to have different departments responding. You may have your social team responding on, on, on Twitters and Instagrams and Facebooks, 
but your support team responding on chat, email, and phone calls, and you may have some direct conversations with your success managers um, from, from clients. It's really important that periodically you get together and, and you make sure that um, everyone's giving the same messaging and everyone's talking the same language. Um, the, you know, the next thing to do is, is, is really need to consider the customer's value to determine action. Um, you know, if this customer has a high lifetime value or the potential to have a high lifetime value, you really want to make sure that you're recognizing that as part of the support, uh, the support conversations. Again, make it really easy for them to, to resolve their issues um, so you can maintain that. Uh, if, they have a lower, if they have a lower lifetime value, make some different decisions, obviously. Um, resolving, the, resolving the issue, it, it sounds, sounds obvious, but it's actually a lot more complex than that sometimes. Um, you know, understanding what the customer's actual issue is um, may, may be harder than you think, so making sure that you're resolving what their actual issue is, is more challenging than you think. Um, confirming that was, that was resolved. Um, just because you didn't hear back from a customer doesn't mean that they're, they've, they've accepted your resolution. They may have moved on to someone else. So, so taking that extra step um, post-resolution to survey them and find out, did we actually resolve your issue? Um, getting feedback on the resolution process. How, how are they engaged? Again, that's another opportunity for you to save an at-risk customer or to lose an at-risk customer. So you want to make sure that your resolution process is sound and built out in a manner that supports you retaining those customers. Uh, and again, similar like we've been saying throughout uh, throughout this conversation, um, really making sure that that those get routed back to the part, different parts of the organization um, that are responsible for the underlying causes. Again, I, I go back to the shipping example, but if, if your logistics team just switched providers and you're starting to get a lot of complaints about shipping, it's real important that they understand that. Um, you know, and then and then also make sure that you socialize them outside of support, like we were just saying. Make sure these get through to surface over your customer success technology um, and tracking trends as opposed to separate one-offs. You know, wh where are things going and, and how are things looking? Again, in our world here, so long as consumers are, are continuously inviting uh, customers to leave reviews, that is a good sign um, as opposed to a, a blip where we have a couple of customers who switched platforms, email platforms on us. That, that is an individual uh, failure that we just have to address. Um, and then also making sure you have goals and, and KPIs and an action plan around how you're going to improve that. Um, we very much have a, have a forward-looking outcome to our customers. So even though it's November 15th right now, we are actively talking with customers and making sure that those customers who are, are likely to renew with us in, in January and February and March are, are having positive experiences today as opposed to waiting until that time of, time of renewal. Um, here's an example of one of our clients, Homebridge, uh, and just kind of their robust Port escalations. They start off, they've got some great reviews, and this first starts with them inviting their customers. How did we do? Um, these calls to action, these subject lines are important. Um, it's, it's not just we, you know, it's we want your feedback, it's company name wants your feedback. How did we do? Um, it goes over where, or in this case here, they're actually reviewing individual loan officers. Um, so displaying that, that trust and transparency on, on their loan officers' pages. And then, of course, following up with with the KPIs of, um, on how their how their different loan officers are performing. So you can take this across product ranges, product categories, warehouses, distribution centers, whatever whatever that's whatever your metric is. Uh, and then finally, um, this is where we can talk about that, that unification. You know, we leverage the Tango on my customer success team, but we also leverage Zendesk on our support team. Those both integrate. And maybe I'll, I'll let the, Omar, if you want to talk a little bit about that and how we uh, equip yeah. customer success with help desk. Yeah, sure. Uh, and, and thanks for that. I think, again, as you said, one of the important things is to really understand uh, the satisfaction of the customer. Uh, direct understanding is from, again, asking them feedback. Uh, but indirect one would be to actually monitor uh, the support escalation. So direct integration with them that allow the customer success team to really understand whether there are high priority tickets that are open or more tickets open that they, they should have been, and they really create alert uh, and workflows to, to know that they need to take action. So um, if, if a customer has too many support tickets or a very high priority ticket that is open, that should be a bad sign and that should influence the health and, and the customer success manager should reach out to really understand uh, what's going on there. So definitely that's part of the recommendation. Um, so with that, uh, I'd actually uh, like to summarize uh, what we spoke about uh, today before we head up to uh, uh, the questions. So 
again, health score is a very important parameter to make sure you manage your uh, customer retention. And the two things you need to think about it, it needs to be clear. So somebody that reads that needs to understand why the customer is red, green, and yellow. And also needs to have a call to action. So understand what do I need to do with it. Uh, we spoke about product consumption, measuring and tracking and reporting how your customers are actually using the product. Uh, spoke about feedback, so we need to proactively ask your customers for feedback, uh, identify with those problems and act upon it. Uh, check to see if they're getting the business results that are actually desired or at least expected. Uh, understand the utilization of the subscription. Uh, understand uh, whether they actually have good interaction or bad interaction with your support. And, and mainly act on your insights and ideally you'll watch your uh, retention grow. Uh, so with that, I'll uh, head it to uh, Lauren. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, great. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm looking through the questions now. Um, and the first question I got, I, I said this in the beginning, but just in case uh, you didn't hear it, we will definitely send out um, a recording and the slides after this, either later today or tomorrow. So uh, you can rest, rest assured you'll, you'll get all of this helpful information. Um, another question that was asked was, how do you calculate your help score? And how often do you update the score? If um, Omer wants to take that one. Sure. Uh, so uh, um, I'm actually, again, using all those uh, five main parameters to calculate the health score. Uh, I'm less delivering in providing with an actual score, numeric number, because I really can't understand the difference between 17.3 and 75. Uh, so uh, our best approach is, again, what is green, yellow, and, and, and red? Uh, and we actually calculated that uh, either in real time depends on parameters or uh, the list on a daily basis. Uh, it is important because, you know, there are always changes with your customer base. There are always, could be always issues and uh, opportunities. Um, and uh, having a frequent check on that is something that really helps the change. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, and then let's see, there's one more here that I think is a good one. Um, so how do health checks uh, with different, sorry, one second, let me read this one. Um, sorry, so what if our customers have multiple products? How do health checks, I guess, with different business outcomes, like how do you measure those different business outcomes for different products? I'm paraphrasing a little yeah. bit there. So yeah, this is challenging because, again, you can have an account that purchases one or five of your products, and you really need to be on top of things and understand where there is there. Our best practice is, one, have a health score for each one of the products. And it should need, it should need, it need to be a different health score because different products uh, will bought for different reasons. Uh, so each one of them should have a customized health score that really gives you a red, yellow, or green. And all of it should actually aggregate into the uh, what we call the parent account. So when I look at an account, ideally I'd like to see this account purchased five products. Three of them are very good. One of them is yellow, and one of them is, is really at risk. And this will help my team drill down and understand whether this account at whole is uh, at risk. Uh, for example, if you can see that the one account that is risk is the, the most meaningful one in terms of revenue, then obviously that's a big problem. If this is non-significant, then there, but also really understand where do I need to take action and uh, point to the specific product. So having a customized health score for each one of the products and aggregate that into the the, the parent yeah, account that, level. Yeah, and I mean, in a real life example for us is, you know, we've got customers on different subscription tiers, and when we decide the health score, I, I may have oversimplified it earlier when I said it's, it's important for us that they're collecting and and, um, and inviting and collecting people. But as you move up our tiers, you know, it also becomes important that they're displaying those reviews on site. So a light customer, we have, uh, you know, an expectation that they're, that they're collecting and reviewing, and they may not have a, the volume of a larger company like a Western Union. So they, they would have, you know, you know, 10 or 15 reviews a month might be an, an accessible health score for them, whereas a larger enterprise customer, the expectations are greater. They should have you know, several hundred fresh reviews every month, and they should be displaying on site. If either one of those things breaks, that's when we start we start looking at things differently. Um, so it's about, about, for us, it's a little bit about expectation management of what we'd expect the customer to do. Great. Okay. Thank you both. Um, and one last question here. I think this one can be for our mayor, maybe Brian. You can comment on what we do here at Trust Pilot. But 
the question is, when is the best time to define goals or objectives that your customers have with a product? Is this either like a pre-closed sales activity or is it during the initial hands-off call or handoff call? Um, yeah, so Amir, if you want to describe maybe what you guys typically see with your customers and we can talk through what we do here at Trust Sure, thanks. Uh, I think first it depends on the type of, I would say, offering that you have. If this is a very large contract with a very large customer, I would highly recommend to define all those things even before you sign the deal. Uh, so I would highly recommend to get the customer success team involved uh, throughout, let's say, the final negotiation of the deal and make sure you guys are aligned with the goals. Uh, but this is for the very large, I would say, contracts. With what we call the standard ones, yes, on the kickoff call, one of the most important things you need to do as a customer success manager is define the goals. And the goals are not, I need to use the product to do this and that, so also very important. It's also, where do I want to be after that? What is the reason? And you know, the best, I'll give you the best example from Tutango. Uh, people will say that they want to buy Tutango because they want to have a health score and they want to have an early warning system, they want to interact with the customers, they want to have process, but ideally, you know, they want to do that in order to improve retention or improve upsell or improve the productivity of the team. So we actually help them outline this and measure not just the product usage goals, but also the business goals. And, and the last thing about it is that it's not just, you know, send and forget. Uh, I would encourage you to continue to have business level discussions with your champions there because their goals might have changed. Uh, you know, they may have been able to solve the retention issues and the focus in 2017 is up So you want to make sure that you keep interacting with them, again, every maybe account of you or once in a while, and make sure that your business goals or all their business goals are uh, uh, perfectly documented in your system. Yep, so yeah, so, so in practice, the way we handle it here is when we sign, you know, uh, a typical package, uh, uh, you know, our light customer, our, our basic customer, um, who has some some worthy goals, but you know it's our objective to get them set up within 72 hours. We know that going into the sale process and, and post signature, uh, it's the integration team to get them up and running quickly, and then that triggers a series of uh, success plays and campaigns that support their onboarding experience and support their first product usage. Um, however, with large organizations, um, it's just the nature of the beast that that things take time. So we have some different expectations with our enterprise customers. We know that they're going to need their their review invitation email that gets sent out. That's going to have to be approved by multiple people, potentially their legal, potentially their PR department. Um, so we understand that there is a longer duration setup period. And so we actually have some different health scores around when we expect those companies to be healthy. And then, um, you know, proactively throughout the, throughout the customer lifecycle, we have different service levels set up um, such that, you know, as, as customers – are going through there they're not being talked to uh, you know the first you know, we're, we're a software subscription service it's very important to me that our customers are talked to throughout their their journey not just the the, the days after signing and the day before renewal um, customer education is a critical part of keeping uh, keeping your product adoption up in this day and age uh, you know, companies like trust and the Tanger are disrupting some old-school business practices there so as our teams continue to evolve and enhance our products that customer education drives continued and, and higher adoption levels. Great. Okay, good. Um, so I know we're a little bit over 2.30, but I think there's just one more question I thought we could maybe go through quickly. And this one I think is for you, Brian. So how do you incentivize customers to actually complete surveys or provide feedback or lead reviews? Yeah, so um, yeah, so the, the, it, part of the invitation process um, is, is clearly um, telling them that, that you know, it, 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 those that entered will be entered will be entered into a monthly raffle per se um, for a, you know an Amazon gift card or or, or just or sorry a, a coupon to your site or a discount off your site. It again depends on who your customers are. I apologize um, for making that assumption. So uh, you know, that's the first part. Second part is you really want to make sure that that the surveys and um, the questions you're asking are, are are short and to the point. You know, when you leave a review with Trustpilot. There's a star rating, a title, and text. That's it. Um, as anyone familiar with email marketing campaigns knows, the more you ask of people, the 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 the, the, uh, the higher the follow-off rate goes along that process. So you know, while not a direct incentive, making it easy for them is an incentive. When they go and they see you know question one of 30, they're just going to zone out and move on in life. Um, whereas if they just see one screen with with you know three text fields they've got to enter, they love it. And, and even having flexibility, while you may want to know 
certain things about your customers and you may feel it's important that you ask certain questions in a survey, um, the customers are going to tell you that in, their, in, in just a free-form text review. They're going to, so letting them go and go to a, to a place where you want the, uh, where you want them to go is, is maybe sometimes more challenging than letting them go where they want to go and talk to you about what they experienced. So those are probably the, the two ways is, is obviously entering into a raffle of some sort. Again, donations to a charity is always a good idea. Um, it makes people feel, it, it shows the company cares in different ways. Um, and then, of course, simple, simple, the simplest simplicity of the, of the invite is an incentive itself. Great. All right. Well, thank you both, Brian and Omer. I uh, hope you all found this helpful, and, and thank you so much for attending this webinar. Um, like I said, we will be emailing you guys later today or early tomorrow with a recording, slide share, and any questions that didn't get answered, I can guarantee that um, you know one of us will follow up with you directly. So thank you so much again for attending and for engaging with us and asking questions, and we hope to see you at our next webinar. Thank you so much.